Hello everyone. On behalf of Concave PhD student group, I would like to welcome you all to our second lecture of this semester. Uh, today, we are very honored to have Dr. Olivier uh, Valeran uh, of the Arizona State University to give us a lecture titled, Can We Queer Architecture and Design Education? This lecture is a part of the Concave lecture series called Questioning Disciplinary Foundations. This semester, our events focus on the issues of equality, justice, inclusion in architecture education. Our goal is to question the inherent biases in the architecture education system and to provide a domain where we can imagine and plan for an activist education. Before leaving the floor to our guest, I would like to introduce him. Dr. Valeran holds a PhD in architecture from McGill University. He has taught at several universities, including University of Laval, University de Quebec, Montreal, and University of California, Berkeley. He is currently teaching at the Design School of uh, Arizona State University. His research focuses on self-identifications, community identifications, and their relation to the design and experience of the built environment on queer and feminist approaches to design education and alternative design practices. He has published his research in various books and journals. Just to mention a few, uh, the book Unplanned Visitors, Queering the Ethics and Aesthetics of Domestic Space, Journal of Architecture Education, Interiors, Design, Architecture, Culture, The Plan, Soma Techniques, Captures, and The Educational Forum. Besides academia, Dr. Valeran uh, previously worked for architecture firms in Washington, D.C., Los Angeles, and Quebec. He currently keeps an installation-based practice. I would like to mention that Dr. Valeran is also a member of the Inclusion, Diversity, Equity, Accountability, and Sustainability Community of the Society of Architecture Historians. Uh, before the lecture, as a final note, I would like to remind you that you can submit your questions in the Q&A chat during and after the lecture. Uh, Youssef and I will join again uh, uh, this session and moderate the Q&A session. Uh, today, we are very happy to have Dr. Olivier Valeran. Uh, Professor, thank you very much for accepting our invitation and joining us today. We are very excited to uh, listen to your lecture and discuss uh, further. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation and the, the great um, uh, introduction. So I'm going to start right away just so that you don't have to hear me babble too, too long. Um, so let me share my screen. Um, so the work that I will be presenting today is coming from kind of two, there, there will be two sides to, to what I'm presenting today. So some of it will be queer approaches to architecture and design kind of as a practice. And then I'll be showing uh, some uh, elements on how queer and feminist um, thinkers have been applying these ideas to design and architecture education. So what I'm presenting today emerges from ongoing research about the breadth of approaches to queerness and space. There's not only one of them. It builds on interviews with queer, with queer and feminist designers and educators and explore all they have sought to imagine modes of creating and teaching that embrace a queer and feminist ethics in both content and methods. I've also chosen to highlight some of the challenges and difficulties of doing such work rather to only discuss the desired outcomes. Um, I'm a dire optimist. I usually always think positively, but it's not that easy to do so, th this kind of work. So I believe that this is a discussion that needs to be had in order to make meaningful but realist changes to uh, the way that we teach and, and the way that we design also so that we can make changes in the built environment. So queerness and architecture have an odd relation. For many people, thinking about queer spaces means identifying sexualized spaces 
are lesbian and gay figures in the history of architecture and design, um, but very rarely by, by bisexual or trans people until a few years ago that was almost completely ignored from architectural discussion, and also including problematic figures such as Philip Johnson, who was notoriously uh, a fascist, a, a, a fascist ideas, and, but is still seen as kind of one of the queer figures in, in architecture and design. So what does, what does that mean when you think about it? For others, such as the emerging designer Adam Nathaniel Furman, that we see some work at, at the right here, it means reclaiming and celebrating architectural postmodernism and what he calls the softly hued and suggestively curved aesthetic that many fellow gay professionals seems to dismiss as unprofessional. There's an idea also kind of in terms of what is professional, what is unprofessional, that comes with some of the gender uh, assumptions behind, behind thinking about queer space. So these very disconnected understandings point to the difficulty of reconciling the, the often abstract discussions of queer theory uh, and the material character of built spaces. It also means that critical design projects seeking to explore the relation of the body to its environment have been rare and not necessarily in, di in dialogue with each other. So beyond metaphorical discussions of the house or the home, critical architecture practitioners have sought to expand from an understanding based on an essentialist understanding of queer bodies and their use of the built environment to instead focus on the experience of built environments and the repression of, of what Joel Sanders called non-compliant bodies, so the bodies that don't fit within what we design. Many discussions of queer space and architecture focus on trying to define the concept, on understanding, on understanding and explaining why queer theory might apply to a reading of material spaces. For example, at the core of one of the earliest architecture-focused queer space theory projects, the Queer Space Exhibition at the Storefront for Art and Architecture in New York in 1994, was a desire to define queer spaces. So building on a framework much more influenced by gay and lesbian studies than queer theory, many of the contributors responded by designing installations that highlighted spaces that were used or designed by gay, lesbian, and bisexual people, with a few also acknowledging the presence of trans people, but as I said, very few of them. One of the few projects that exhibited a broader understanding of the relational potential of a core space understanding of architectural spaces was architect Jürgen Mayer H. Auswarming that we see here. The work, a house-shaped object covered with red temperature sensitive paint, was one of the earliest in an ongoing series of installation and furniture pieces where Mayer H. explores temperature sensitive coatings to think about the relation between bodies objects and spaces. When touched, an ephemeral trace is left, an unsubtle reminder of how domestic spaces are marked by its outside influences, but also an opening towards a broader understanding of queer space that contrasts with other works focused on the visibility of queer people. So Mayor H focuses on the potential disclosure of one's self-identifications through its centric action with the material characteristics of in this case, domestic spaces. The original proposal by Mayor H, and we see here some of the, the elements from the archive at the storefront, suggested that the paint be applied to objects in public spaces through the city, such as elevators, interiors, uh, revolving doors, or subway, subway poles. So really this idea of having these traces throughout the city. In later projects, Mayor H has layered this research on temperature sensitive materials with an exploration of data protection patterns, the patterns that we see in the inner sides of an envelope to protect confidential com correspondence from prying eyes. So this research, through which Mayor has collected and archived hundreds of these data security patterns, stems from his interest in how they can simultaneously veil and reveal in a way that kind of blurs private and public, so something that queer theorists are very interested in. Yes, this printed, enlarged, or modeled the patterns into three-dimensional objects, often using the same temperature sensitive paint and ink that we saw in the earlier project. So the, the data security pattern in those cases thus obscures and reveals elements. 
So on the bed, the sheets that we see here, on seats that is uh, has also designed, body heat leaves an ephemeral trace once the person has left, described by Mayer as the aftermath of seduction, when, quote, you display your underwear, you display certain information about your body, you show a temperature landscape of your body. So the use of disappearing paint or ink and data security patterns both hides and reveals, linking to queer theorists' understanding of queer space, blurring of the private and public, of the domestic and the communal. So while Mayor H acknowledges traces of the body, he also simultaneously abstracts them and avoids the traditional homoerotic imagery uh, associated with queer architecture. So often when they're talking about queer space, people will put pictures of, of kind of naked man over space, over architectural spaces, and that's kind of the focus of, of many of those works. But in, in Mayer's work, there's kind of a, a second level that, that is added to that. So the bed sheet refers to the privacy of the bedroom, but at the same time, do not necessarily imply sexual relations solely. As highlighted by the image that we see here, used by Mayor H to present the work on his website, a single man sleeping in the bed with his body trace left over after rolling on his side. So the context might eroticize the objects, but the abstraction of the body paired with the patterns borrowed from a very non-erotic context merges different layers of meaning, Tying queer space concern with broader issues uh, like fear, like co uh, control, like surveillance that he further explored in other work. So if Mayor H was part of an early wave of queer space thinking and architecture, his later work has not been engaging as directly with the issue. This mirrors a broader shift in architecture away from queerness that lasted until the second half of the 2000s. Spanish architect Andres Raquet is among an increasing number of practitioners and theorists who have again showed an interest in exploring how communal and self-identifications linked to gender and sexuality challenge understandings of architectural and urban spaces as neutral containers. Raquet developed his thinking about how buildings perform as what he called political agents and how architects can take a more politically engaged role. And he has done so with his, what, uh, his Office for Political Innovation. So I'll, I'll talk about the, the office as a whole for, from now. So there are critical projects merging, uh, merging politically informed design research with installation, videos, performances, flip the focus from buildings to the body as an architectural and urban material when thinking about the relation between virtual and physical spaces. IKEA disobedience is their response to the embrace of diversity claimed by furniture giant IKEA, uh, challenging IKEA's subjection um, of its universal appeal or that it can respond to the needs of every human being. Reacting more specifically to the 2007 the Independent Republic of Your Own campaign, they have set up an architectural situation, what they call an architectural situation, that seeks to expose non-familiar domesticities against their word, again their words, uh, using IKEA furniture as building blocks. And so to subvert the normative IKEA model, um, they present performances of private lives that contrast with the whitewash youth obsess an heteronormative approach of IKEA's allegedly representative advertising, as they explain in their IKEA Disobedience Manifesto. Well, quote a few words. IKEA delivers societies. IKEA is a purveyor of social structuration. 98% of the people depicted in the IKEA catalog are young. 92% of them are blonde. They all have some sort of family life. Now, towards the end, um, the sense of home or household's life, however, may also be constructed from day to day in quite different fashion. Not all of us are healthy. Not all of us are young. Not all of us are into having children. So in, in Haki's words, in, uh, in the ad, domesticity was seen as isolated from many of the processes by which the social is disputed and constructed. It's, that, it's as though you leave behind all the conventions of the outer world when you arrive at home and somehow gain political independence there. So you see the same kind of questioning of the separation between private and public that Mayer was, was doing. So the, the Office for Political Innovation does devise a multidisciplinary and multi-format project involving act for IKEA furniture, where local community members are invited to publicly perform their everyday private talents, behaviors, and discussions. 
Over months of research in Madrid and New York, where they interviewed many people to study how they developed their own authenticity, they identify households who they saw as not reflecting conventional family patterns and whose various self-identifications are closely interlinked with their living and often working arrangement. For them, these examples show that IKEA produces a reality that is not universal. People actually engage in pub political projects from their living rooms, kitchens, bathrooms, or bedrooms. So the focus on the domestic and more particularly the challenges to its assumed separation from public life puts Haki's project in direct relation with other critiques of space and it highlights the strong links between physical spaces, objects, and self-identification and embodiment. So gender and sexuality even become the explicit focus of some of the, the narratives. For example, with an interviewee from the Madrid group who wrote, came from a tiny village to a squat for lesbian women. She organized the architecture in a way that produced an upper space for intimacy, where the residents could minimize the, the risk of changing the way they relate to their bodies or to their sexuality, and a ground floor that promoted a transformation of the way the neighborhood sees lesbianism. The process of finding her sexuality and even her body could never have happened without this space, end of quote. However, the, way, the work remains carefully edited by Afpolin and not unlike the IKEA catalog, presents a specific understanding of the politics of domestic space. Afpolin is using research rhetoric, rhetoric so the, the wording of research, the wording of what we do with, with academia, for example, to make visible the normativity of IKEA's domesticity and particularly its reliance on understanding the home as an apolitical space, on building its message on an assumed, and inevitably gendered and focused on the traditional family making, oppositions between the domestic and the urban. Visibility is thus at the core of IKEA the Sylvania. Compared with Mayor H staging of unspecified bodies, Haki brings specific bodies to the forefront, highlights their diversity and divergence from the models offered by typical representation of architectural spaces, and the work is specifically about making visible people that would otherwise be absent from representations of architecture, both academic and very, very mainstream representations of architecture like the IKEA catalog. So the IKEA Disobedient was originally commissioned by Spain's Ministry of Culture and later performed, exhibited, and made part of the collection. So you see that, that it's a, a work that seeks to challenge architecture, but also is doing it within an institutional framework. And um, so in the word of the MoMA's, the Museum of Modern Arts curators, this work was acquired to make a statement and to add to the collection an example of transformation happening in the way we understand architecture. This is great, but it presents as something new, something that has been happening for many years in critical theories and histories of architecture. And furthermore, it appears in an exhibition, so the nine plus one ways of being political, that despite being supposedly about new ways to understand architecture as political, it was mostly about restaging projects by superstar architects and focusing on the history of individuals and single buildings. So this project kind of appears as a token acknowledgement that simultaneously silences the rich histories developed over the years by architecture, architectural historians to present the social and cultural relations between people, communities, and the built environment, as well as the, the it highlights the, the absence of gender and sexuality from the other nine sections of the exhibition. So it positions gender and sexuality as something marginal. Uh, it's the plus one in the nine plus one ways of being political. So it really frames it as, as something to the side and even so the, the exhibition was divided between the main museum of modern architecture and the PS1, so a satellite museum, where the plus one was. So the gender and sexuality part was related to another borough uh, of New York City. So you see that, that there's attempts to bring these discussions within kind of broader institutional discussions, but there's also limit to what's being done. So Intimate Strangers uh, is another example of, of the of Hake and the Office for Political Innovation work that kind of directly address sexuality through uh, a multimedia installation about the gay dating app Grindr for the London Design Museum. 
It further expands the exploration of digital urbanism and their relation to political projects. So the work, building again on two works of field work research at Grinders headquarters in West Hollywood, is an investigation of how the app is used both by oppressive regimes wanting to track down gay people and raise them from their national narrative, and from gay refugees seeking to protect themselves in refugee camps and integrate new communities. So it explores how a commercial smartphone app devoted mainly to facilitating sexual relations between men, can be more broadly understood, exploring both the network technology supporting it, for example, the presence of servers in countries where same-sex relations are banned, and its contribution to transforming social relations between homosexual men uh, or men seeking sex between men and um, with other men, as well as activist networks. So the apps for, for Hake and the Office for Political Innovation are a way for some to mediate their ethnic and national identities for different audiences, to mask or display their community identities with more control than if they were doing so in a physical environment. Um, so it presents the work in design and architecture setting. Uh, it, asks, it also asks what role spatial designers can play in understanding, shifting, or challenging this emerging layer of communal, communal identifications, and show how thinking about different ways of how our identities play a role in the way that we experience space, sometimes calls for, for new ways of looking at those spaces. Uh, one of the few discussions of course, space and architecture that continued between the, the 1990s and the 2010s was Kellerina Bonnevier's Behind Straight Curtains uh, Towards a Queer Feminist Theory of Architecture from her uh, PhD dissertation from, from uh, around 2005 that was published as a book in 2007. In this book, Bonnevier explores how a queer feminist critique of architectural structures can build on theatrical enactments of architecture that focused on subject positions and what she called the entanglements of actors, acts, and architecture. So she later brought this framework to Miket, a queer feminist art and design collective she co-founded in 2012 with Therese Christensen and Marianne Alves Silva, later joined by Ulis Algren and Adamarda Danielson that you see on this photo. Like Off Berlin, the collective uses research to think about space as a social enactor but it also makes explicit the close relation between a queer ethics of space and an aesthetics of queer space, as their name highlights. So miket is a Swedish word that means much, a lot. It underlines their maximalist approach to querying the rigidity of architecture, their interest in access as a queer feminist tactic. And this builds on feminist graphic designer Stella Levan de Bradville quote that she will never, never forget to include people of color, people of different points of view, people of different genders, people of different sexual preferences. Dirty architecture, fuzzy theory, and dirty design must also be out there. Feminist design is an effort to bring the values in, of the domestic sphere into the public sphere. Feminist design is about letting diverse voices be heard through caring, relational strategies of working and design. So through their focus on aesthetics, Make it wish to highlight how norms are manifested in spatial and material design, but also to challenge these norms through design. For them, this thinking is a way to create uh, reparative spaces rather than paranoid spaces, and to avoid being only critical as proposals for transformation are also important, and you'll see it in some of their work. So this desire to explore differences and make visible uncelebrated experiences has led Make it to examine how different people experience their privacy and publicness, in their case, often focusing on queer women and non-binary people. So even looking at the example that we've looked at until now, they are doing something different by not focusing mostly on, on gay men. So their practice focuses on the design of performative spaces where personal relations and the experience of intimacy and eroticism are explored. One of their major projects, the club scene, evolved over 13 acts between 12, 12, um, 2012 and 2016 that restaged salons, clubs, and other meetings, meeting spaces significant for queer and feminist activism. 
So the different acts explore and merge a wide variety of spaces geographically and historically. For example, the, the first one here, Lala Salon from 2012, celebrates a contemporary Beijing salon through its restaging in the historic flat of Frederica Bremer, a Swedish feminist reformer at Arsta Castle in Sweden. So bringing to, uh, 2000, the 2010s with the late 19th century. While the third, Staffo Island, start the video here, uh, held at an experimental theater in Stockholm, is a tribute to both the poet and Sappho and the queer club Sappho Island in Uganda, which had just closed its door the year before be uh, as a consequence of the country's crackdown on homosexuality. Through the club scene, Nikit underlines how the social, the erotic, and the political are inextricably linked in the use of space by queer communities showing the similarities between diverse spaces, such as a secret club held in a private apartment and a hyper-visible nightclub with a confrontational and uncompromising attitude. The night spaces examined by Mickett are examples that highlight how communities are created in both domestic and commercial spaces, blurring the limits between the two and allowing the political, what is often discussed as the public, conversations in control, what are often seen as private spaces. For them, the aesthetics of salons and clubs repeated through costumes, design, uh, decor, guests, dance, performances, meals, can be understood as both space and activity, producing self-definition, recognition, and a sense of home that are not specific to queer people, but particularly important to them. So the strategies developed in the club scene are a way for Make It to challenge our contemporary mainstream architecture is still operating within that modernist framework of a universal body that informs how spaces are planned and then aestheticized. To think about how to create a society where there is room for everyone, they more specifically build from the tensions they feel within their own embodied experience of practice. So as Bonnevere notes, to do this, we need to question the modernist design and research traditions of reduction and specialization, since they exclude bodies and behaviors and build upon competition. By doing this, our own bodies also come into play. For instance, being an architect trained in a modernist tradition, I sense the aesthetic challenge as a torsion in my body when my preferences are turned towards the untied and the inconsequent. This triggers me since it promises escape from the hierarchical logic of good or bad subjects and research method. That logic is counterproductive to artistic research since it creates stage fright and the circular reasoning of prescribed answers to given questions. In modernist design processes, uh, consequence and discipline are worshipped at the expense of different. So the events designed by Nikit does reinvent the modernist desire to create a universalizing international design language to instead focus on international relations, to explore the transnational points of convergence and queer resistance to a heteronormative spatial construction. This understanding supports a practice that is, that is much more embodied and involved than other practices focused on critical architectural installation. Um, Miket's approach is both historical and performative, interpreting historic examples through care and effect as an activist tool. They use history not as a neutral narrative, but as a powerful and effective way to reclaim figures and experiences and to mix contemporary preoccupation with past role models. It anchors contemporary queer lives in a historic narrative deliberately counter-arguing an erasure of marginalized lives as being a recent invention. As they note, our methodology can be described as simultaneously critical and reparative, as I already said. We endeavor to overcome the unproductive and worrying control where analysis gets separated from suggestion. So they're particularly aware of some of the ch challenges linked to the fact that queer and feminist work in architecture and design is often situated within academic context, which makes it easier to be developed abstractly without taking into account embodied experiences. Hence, the desire to design the public space of research to perform in the manner of the clubs we research, allowing them to explore the emotions attached to those spaces. The maximalist approach preferred by Mickett 
creates a stage for these emotions. So the use of different aesthetics within each of their projects and between projects seeks to empower safer spaces. Refraining from a single aesthetics allows the creation of different narratives and what they call emotional lines, something that is further pushed by the blurring of ownership created by Mickett's methods. Rejecting the public notion of pub purely your original work, they restage spaces created by others, they reuse elements from previous projects to multiply their meanings. They ask participants to engage in the creation of the work through props and costumes deployed to alter their appearance, extending and supporting various bodies' relations to space and sociality. So they create safer spaces that aim to acknowledge the relational and multi-perspectival aspect, acknowledging the asymmetries of class, ethnicity, age, that also come into play in our experience of the environment. So their work merges concerns developed by earlier queer and feminist architects and historians to create an activist practice with a clearly visible presence in community life. To the focus on making visible spaces of queer and feminist histories that have been hidden or have disappeared, they add critical interventions and performances that highlight social and political critiques informed by queer and feminist theory. So these three practices move architectural discussions of domesticity beyond the simple understanding of the house as a container for family life. They understand domesticity as being at the nexus of social and political relations that converge around the body. All three practices ultimately seek to challenge dichotomies that are at the core of much architectural thinking, where bodies and much often a heavily gendered understanding of bodies are used to value and frame formal approaches and interest over the occupation of space. While studying in, in, in these examples and others for my PhD, I was struck by the fact that many of them were seeing their teaching work as integral to the queer work they were doing. I thus reached out to more queer and feminist informed design educators to better understand the multiple pedagogical approaches being developed. The educators I interviewed were from different disciplines, involved in the design of the built environment in North America, Europe, and Australia. So differences between their professional, institutional, and geographical context are often part of the discussion, as you'll see. And they also noted how thinking about gender and sexual orientation represented for them a call for a broader rethinking of how different elements of our identity intersect in our experience and use of space, and how we can resist and reshape design norms to make our built environment more inclusive. So this takes a space in, in, in different ways, as you will see. Um, and, and yeah, so I'll, I'll kind of move right in, into that. So the work they are doing does not come out of nowhere. For example, in the 1990s, the emergence of critical pedagogy and challenges from identity politics prompted some architectural educators to address the normative and oppressive frameworks that are, were shaped, that are still shaping much of architectural pedagogy. Earlier, Pioneering initiatives such as a Women's School of Planning and Architecture from 1975 to 1981 had already experimented in opening the doors of architectural education to previously excluded groups such as women. Others have sought to document and challenge the normativity and lack of diversity of curriculum and syllabi in architecture by pointing out the lack of representation of women and racialized people in the historical canon, in faculty representation, or in jury composition. In the mid-1990s, in parallel to the emergence of queer space theory and architecture, people, uh, scholars in education, such as Deborah Fritzman or Susan Newman, wrote about the tensions brought by queer theory to education and pedagogy, underlining how questions of sexual orientation are usually not given any thought, being seen as their own discrete field. But Britman suggests that sexual orientation and gender can be useful when thinking about both friendships, community, research, methodology, curriculum theorizing, and educational theory, and that queer theories can be relevant not just for those who identify as gay or lesbian. She identifies two pedagogical stakes. The first is that we need to think ethically about what discourses of difference, choice, and visibility mean in classrooms, in pedagogy, and in how education can be thought about. And you'll see examples about this in a few seconds. And then that we need to think about the structures of disavowal within education, 
or the refusal to engage a traumatic perception that produces the subject of reference as a disruption as the outside to normalcy. So it's, it's very easy, especially for, for architects and, and designers to say, oh, this doesn't have anything to do with, with architecture. Let's just focus on form, for example. Um, so educational scholar Kevin Kumashiro further developed this to argue that an anti-oppressive education must address four perspectives. First, we must educate for the other by improving the experiences of students who are othered or in some way oppressed in and by mainstream society. Second, we must educate about the other by working against oppression through a focus on what all students, privileged and marginalized, know and should know about the other. This aspect has been integral to the efforts of feminists, racialized or queer historians and designers who have focused on making visible how people of diverse identities have contributed to the design professions or all minorities have gained limited access to the profession. Third, we must develop education models that are critical of privileging and othering. Educators and students need to examine how not only how some groups and identities are othered in society, but also how some groups are privileged, as well as how this dual process is legitimized and maintained by social structures and competing ideology. In design, this is done, for example, by queer activists challenging the binary design and regulations of public restrooms. Finally, according to Kumashiro, we must strive for an education system that changes students in society. Oppression is produced when certain discourses are cited over and over. Meaningful change that thus requires becoming involved in altering the citational practices that constitute this association. So, for example, in, in um, in, in architecture and design, the weight of tradition and importance of studio culture makes this the artist to achieve, but there have been efforts to rethink architecture school beyond a master and trainee's model with its implicit racial and gender bias towards a more collaborative one based on dialogue between instructor and students, allowing failure, bringing play into your thinking about design education, as well as with the communities and users for whom projects are designed. So these perspectives inform how design educators have sought to rethink their teaching methods building on queer and feminist uh, framework. So one strategy that I've, uh, I've seen in what people were doing was supporting queer students, making sure that they, they stayed mentally and physically healthy and giving them the tools to become more engaged. But that, were, uh, that was also kind of bringing that beyond just queer students. Queer educators obviously are not the only ones to do this, as many instructors develop studio contracts to initiate discussions with students about queer design culture. But to focus on, on and encouraging all students, queer or non-queer, to understand their body and their self-identifications mean helping them be more, be more aware of how others' bodies and their gender, sexuality, race, age, or able-bodiedness interact with space but also our norm structure, the design profession. And one of the things that I've seen when, when talking with educators is that if most queer and feminist educators feel more useful when supporting students' initiatives than when taking the lead themselves, um, once they reach a position of institutional power within the, their institution, they feel a responsibility to become role models and to create these occasions for challenging um, the racialized, sexualized, or gender assumption of architecture school. But this is not without its risk. Many interviewees have revealed that many North American educators who have attempted to integrate gender and sexuality issues in their studio teaching have been faced with strong negative pushback from students, going as far as being the object of, of rumors from students about their sexual orientation or their, their relation with, with students. This seems particularly true for women in architecture programs. Um, but on the contrary, I could people in the interior design programs or in programs outside of North America seem to say that their, their schools have been more welcoming. Another strategy has been to make visible queer designers. Um, and we've talked about this a bit, but queering design pedagogies mean multiplying points of view opening the discipline not only to other disciplines, but also to multiple experiences of the built environment and um, the visibility and closeness of possible positive role models 
remains one of the most effective way to transform society through, through many different things, including design. The third one, which is very challenging for, for architects and designers, is to allow failure, is to challenge to the culture and assumption about what goes on in the so interviews have this confirmed that many educators see a queer feminist approach as being one that teaches students to challenge and subvert the, the educational framework they are going through and the profession they will enter by, by extension. So um, they, some of them insist on using, for example, Jack Alberstam's uh, notion of queer failure that under certain circumstances, Failing, losing, forgetting, unmaking, undoing, unbecoming, not knowing may in fact offer more creative, more cooperative, more surprising ways of being in the world. And if we think of design as something that is supposed to be creative, this notion of, of allowing ourselves to fail should be at the core of what, what we're doing. But this is very hard for, for students to do because if you have a professor that encourages you to not finish your projects, to be more open to our experimentation and you compare to other studios where there, there's kind of very polished work that is that is being done, you might feel that your work is less good than, than what is being done in other studios. So finally, a third, uh, a fourth uh, strategy is to act beyond school, to engage with the communities, to operationalize a belief in transforming the built environment and its relation to gender and sexual. And some of the examples of this has been Laurie Brown's uh, feminist approach to designing or to thinking about the debates around abortion clinics that she started in, in studio work and has moved beyond studio work. Joel Sanders, Susan Stryker, and Terry Cogan's work on creating st stalls uh, to prototype gender neutral restrooms. Again, kind of building on what Sanders was doing in his, his seminars in, in, uh, in, our, in schools and then expanding that to, to an activist practice. Or Q-Space, um, a, a design-led, uh, uh, a student-led initiative to engage public ed education to discuss the biopolitical framing of gender and sexuality in everyday spaces. For example, thinking about all queer, homeless youth, or again, uh, gender neutral restroom. So, um, one, one of the things is that there seems also to be a difficulty in translating queer theory to the design of spaces. So often this is done in seminar rather than studio, especially in North America. So for me, what, one of the issues could be to think positively about what it means to, to use translation as a pedagogical, pedagogical tool. What does it mean to bring studio educators and students from, um, from uh, other disciplines and to studio? to use the body as a language to understand space, to translate what we call difficult topics, discuss them as spatial issue, or to think about the everyday and spaces traditionally deemed unworthy by traditional history and theory. And so the, the strategies here represent, uh, presented show how queer thinking can challenge the normative assumptions that are, are rarely acknowledged in architecture. Expanding from a focus on gender and sexual sexual orientation, they contribute to making architecture and design education, and by extension, eventually the disciplines, more inclusive and knowledgeable about people and community. So in our call about, um, about uh, queer, ped queer pedagogy, Ritzman's notes that the questions I raise about the possibility of architect articulating pedagogies that call into question the conceptual geography and normalization requires something larger than simply an acknowledgement of gay and lesbian subjects in, in the work that we do. The discipline of architecture, and by extension its education, is still very much shaped by a desire for a single rational truth that does not address the diversity of lived experiences. In my own experience teaching about diversity and design, I've had students challenging racialized or trans people's claim for changes to the built environment. For example, they argued that trans people's requests for gender neutral restrooms were not based in what they called an empirical evidence. But when I asked them about how the interview based research they had to read or the numerous claims presented in media did not represent empirical evidence of the need to rethink public restrooms, some of the students argued that this evidence did not fit with the truth 
that could be shared by everyone in pursuit of a greater good in design. So what can be shared by everyone? So this again underlines the framework that shapes most design schools. There is an impulse to seek for universalizing, normalcy-seeking solutions that let students and later professionals talk about the public good without really thinking about that there is a difference between their, their understanding of an issue and how users live this issue. Designing for diversity does not mean designing for diverse people. It means helping people, diverse people design for themselves. But this is not necessarily comfortable. Uh, so these reactions to discussion of, of gender and sexuality that I was talking about suggest the potential for seldom explored design pedagogies in, in architecture. In the late 1990s, Megan Baller developed the idea of a pedagogy of discomfort that challenges racism and sexism uh, to see how they combine with enlightened thought and education structures by controlling our emotion to maintain various, various form or, forms of injustice. So what she, she proposes is a pedagogy of discomfort that is both an invitation to use critical inquiry to help students and other people better understand the ways that, as she says, emotions define how and what one chooses to see and conversely not to see. So if, um, if we don't know that we're thinking in one way about something, we can't see it. And often it's our emotion, it's our comfort or discomfort about something that, that frames this. So for Bowler, teachers should not seek to change students' belief, but instead to challenge students to question their beliefs and emotional attachment to those beliefs. Um, but as she acknowledged, this can often lead to strong emotional resist resistance, what she calls discomfort, linked to fears of losing one's personal and cultural identity. So in a pedagogy of discomfort framework, teachers should encourage students to explore why they are feeling these emotions in real um, so while we sometimes in design already encourage students to self-reflect, those reflections seldom address students' emotional reaction to the project's objectives, to users' life experience or their own experience of the projects uh, explored. So, uh, for example, in one of the studio I, I where I taught, uh, I visited homeless shelters with students and the students were really shocked by what they saw and that kind of the experience that that the homeless people had and it really informed the way that they were then able to think about how their own identity play a role in, in the, their perception of the, the studio project that they were working on. So students are too often taught to approach projects as neutral containers and their role as an outside observer coming to help shape the spatial needs of users but the life experience of minoritized designers and thus students often conflicts with this stat status with sometimes important personal impact. So to end, Korean design means building relations, offering layered opportunities, multiplying possible interaction experiences. Korean design pedagogy in turn means multiplying points of view, opening the discipline to not only other disciplines, but to the everyday and thinking about our experiences as humans human beings, impacts and transform our design. Queer thinking helps be more welcoming of everybody. Recognizing the diversity of embodied experiences makes us better teachers, in my case, makes us better designers. I don't wanna say that I'm a better teacher, but, but I hope that this is bringing me to, to being a better teacher. These strategies have been developed in many other disciplines, but they have yet to truly impact design and architecture education. Furthermore, as I interviewed the educators working around queer and feminist theory, I was shocked to see how difficult they felt it was to bring these themes in their teaching, and particularly in studio teaching. And so, and also of the risk they felt in doing so. In that sense, a pedagogy of discomfort can be uneasy not only for students, but also for instructors. So I would end with this question, how can we navigate productively those risks coming from both colleagues and students so that we can transform broadly the way we design and discuss architecture. And that also applies to kind of when we work with clients, when we work with users, putting our own personal identity on the table to create that connection and that dialogue with, with users can be risky for everyone. And so kind of how can we work around this and in, in how we um, aim to uh, design a better built environment? 
So thank you very much for listening to me. Hopefully that brings a lot of questions. And I'm going to, yeah, open to any question. That was just great. Thank you very much. Uh, actually, I have a, I would like to start with a question. Uh, while listening to your lecture, one of the standout uh, concepts for me is hacking. Uh, starting at the beginning, like hacking the material uh, yeah. to represent the intimacy and then the uh, memory of the material in it, and then hacking uh, heteronormal spaces to uh, create spaces for the queer bodies. So my question is that what is the role of hacking in design pedagogy? How can we use hacking as a strong tool to uh, advocate for queer education or queering architecture and design education. Yeah, no, that's a that's a very good one. And I actually, kind of, I I didn't necessarily see it as it as kind of hacking being that that kind of thing that that comes to it or the the word hacking itself. So in my case, often when I talk about this, I talk about messiness and I talk about not being kind of purist, which we we often tend to do. I think. Uh, so there, there's kind of two things going on in, in architecture. We have re very good, big egos. We, we have, we're able to speak our mind, but at, at the same time, we seek to be recognized because we, we know that architecture is, is, is kind of often seen by many people as being something to the side. So we try to frame our things as, hey, architecture is something that is scientific, that is artistic, that is. So we kind of try to position ourselves to, to other. So when I talk about messiness, and I think hacking is the same thing, is kind of saying, okay, no, we're actually people who are who do a lot of things, who are trying to le learn from from many different disciplines and to kind of bring all of this together. And I see kind of queerness and I see feminist practices as as being a, a good part about kind of d trying to to underline or to kind of show that that fact that when we try to do to use a very pure method in both the design or, or education or research, when we try to be very pure in what we do, we're actually not helping ourselves because the, 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 our built our experience of the built environment is about using a table not for what it's been it's been planned for. It's it's about all of that, and I think that um, kind of as or. or um, because um, because uh, amongst other people, but 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 uh, because um, uh, women and and queer people have been for a long time kind of sidelined from from mainstream architectural di discourses and and kind of what what is celebrated in architecture, um, there is certainly um, uh, an opportunity here to. Reframe those those elements, and I think I mean in the case of, of hacking, for example, it's it's certainly hacking the IKEA furniture is a way to visually show, kind of be seen and say, oh look, we're doing something that is not expected with this furniture, um, and we're doing it to show something else. So it's it's where it's the same thing that uh, that Miket is doing is there's there's and they're really positioning it in terms of aesthetics and ethics, but kind of, okay, we're doing something on an aesthetic side. We're saying that we can bring, we can, you can do whatever. It, it doesn't matter what kind of aesthetics you have. You can bring all of these aesthetics together. But when you start doing this, it brings people to question, okay, what is, what is behind that? And what kind of, what kind of expectations are there? What does this aesthetic mean? Is it, what is understood as masculine and feminine? Why is it understood that way? What does it say? Why do we need to talk about design as something that a masculine design or a feminine design? But if you don't have these elements that kind of just shake you a bit, it's it, it's harder to do so. So I think that's kind of some of yeah some of some of the uh, the elements that are there. And again, I'm using just some examples, but clearly. Um, uh, Kind of also it it as I said it brings something that comes also it it releases some pressure I think on students and and even kind of on practitioners if you try start thinking about okay I I 
I'm aiming to have one perfect project, instead of thinking, okay, I'm just exploring different solutions. These solutions um, are as valid as one one as, as the other, and they're really painted by my own personal values. So what does that say? But when I start then practicing, that I think I think it makes designers and architects much more um, uh, able to listen to what users are, are asking. If you've been taught that what you were designing was only one of the solutions possible and that uh, it might not be the best solution for, for you who you are, are working with and that you need to be able to do that. So I think kind of even then, it, it, if you think about the messiness of the project or hacking the project, it allows you allow you to come back to your project and be much less attached to the, 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 the project itself and the object. Sorry, I tend to babble sometimes, but, but hopefully it answers some of that. No, that was, that's great, thank you. Uh, I have a question about access or accessibility. So you, in one of your slides, when you were going through your strategies in design education, I really, I really appreciated that it was queer strategies in design education and not strategies for queering design education, mm -hmm. but the strategies themselves were inherently queer. I thought that was really, really fun. Um, but I think it's like crucial to, to recognize and take into account the socioeconomic experience of queer individuals. Like for example, with, with trans women in society, the access they have be, the access they've been, they've been afforded throughout their adolescence and young adulthood, there's an inherent barrier there that exists in the institution and institutional design education that makes it inaccessible. And so with supporting queer students, it's having a population of, so, I mean, to be frank, in my, this is my 14th year in, in the architecture education world, and I've never had a trans classmate or, or a trans student. And I understand that like queer spaces, like the ones uh, you, were, you were sharing with us today, they inherently reject the institution because the institution is systematically designed to, to oppose or oppress the queer body and queer thought. So what, how can that be tackled? Yeah, and that's a that's a also kind of a, a a question that I really struggled with as I was um, developing my my research because again we're working within um, a very heavily institutionalized um, world, both in academic like in the academia framework that that supports um, uh, architecture education, but also within the, the profession. So it's, I mean, you need a lot of money to build. That's one thing. So in terms of kind of, and even to do these these projects that I've looked at. So I, as you could tell, kind of the projects that, that, I, that, that I've been exploring have been a lot of, of critical design installation there. there's not been that many built projects. I, I've explored some, but they, but um, but it, they bring very different questions. And to access those, it's not everyone who has access. And and that kind of, to find other people other than than gay men, kind of white, rich white gay men with with a lot of uh, connections that were that add the money and that add the time to have this practice in parallel to their. Their, the work that they were doing uh, as designers or something was was uh, very difficult. Miket is one of the very rare practice that I've been doing, and, and they can do it because they 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 had a kind of a, an educate. They, they were educators who had that time to do it, uh, or I mean, who had the, the opportunity to do it in parallel to the the teaching they were doing. And even so, when when talking with Katarina Benavier, there's kind of a, was saying oh she she stopped teaching she has stopped teaching for a time now because she's seeing it as it's being so difficult to change things within her institution and that's an in, in, an institution that has one of the most celebrated feminist uh, research group in the whole world where, where she was teaching so so even in, in an institution like this there's a limit so that's kind of from the institution side but then as you say 
from the socioeconomic side of even kind of getting access to uh, design schools, to architecture schools. There's, I, I, I never, couldn't necessarily go into, into this in the presentation, but there's tons of research show, showing how um, uh, LGBTQ people are generally, like, even though there's many LGBTQ people who have a lot of money, there's also many who are below the poverty line, who are um, um, shut away from, from their, their homes and you have to kind of rebuild a life outside of their home before even getting to the university or have to struggle with all of this. So to be able to go uh, to reach architecture school or even to go through architecture school so we all know the, the mental health um, um, pressure that is that is brought by by still most of the architecture schools because of some of the traditions that, that we have. So when we're when you're struggling maybe with kind of uh, your gender identity or kind of a, a transitioning process, for example, as you also have to go through that, that pressure of, of the design school, uh, might be very, very hard. So so I completely agree with you that that it, it brings different question and that's why I always start with first strategy is supporting students and that seems very easy but that is actually kind of the most important one and you can't get into dismantling structural issues if you're not even supporting the students and if you're not making sure that poor students who are going through school and are uh, living very kind of who are struggling through it uh, don't have the support to do so. And that would be the same with racialized students. Like, I mean, there is there's a lot of studies who have shown how it is still really hard for, a, I mean, I'm, I haven't been through that. I'm a white man who went through school in North America, so that wasn't really an issue for me. But I still, I talk to students every day about this experience and how, how critical it is to have that support and how, grateful they, they are from from um, professors and instructors who are giving that support. So it is it is very important to get to these other other steps. So I don't know if it answers in any way, but but kind of um, I, I completely agree with you and kind of how these, these different elements come together in there. Yeah, my my uh, experience or observation of queer spaces is that they're very um, grassroots they are very community driven and not uh where the rules of it are not handed down mm -hmm. and i think in an, in an academic setting where we just keep learning about le corbusier where we keep learning yeah. about all these white men uh none of that is is uh welcome in these queer spaces because there's a whole other narrative there are there's a whole other history that is uh being passed down, well, I guess passed horizontally, not yeah. necessarily vertically. And so I think making visible queer designers as a second bullet point is very important. Yeah, and I, I mean, it also goes, if I can just kind of complete on that, that kind of if we think about precedent studies and if we think about uh, art, our architectural history and design history, it's still overwhelmingly focused on specific figures. So again, kind of even if you want to try to show queer figures in architectural history, where do you go to? You go to Philip Johnson and it's it's quite, <laughs> like it doesn't fit at all with, with these queer experiences that you're showing. So it also brings the, a question about, okay, but what, who should we look to? And, and that's why I also kind of really often kind of point out the, the need to think about everyday spaces and to recognize that maybe architectural history is not necessarily about the design by this specific designer, but by me looking at a bar, looking at the community space that we have no idea who designed, that is not a very pure example of, of whatever style we're looking for, but that is a space that has been used, that has been transformed through space by people, and that this is part also of architectural uh, thinking. And then the same, yeah, so, so kind of, I think that's one way also of, of wearing the way that, that we design. It, it's, it's going towards kind of um, examples that are not represented. So if you, if you look at um, 
try to do a homeless a studio on homeless shelter and ask your students to find precedents of homeless shelters on architecture firms website we know they have done webs they have done done homeless shelters they're often pro bono work and they almost never go on their websites because they're not sexy projects but they are very important projects they are projects that are being lived or that are being uh, and they're often very very interesting projects that have challenges that are as important as as kind of uh, other challenges that we have in a museum or in a in a library, but but they're just kind of ignored, and this is something that we'll have to design when we when we go into practice after completing school. So, so I think that's why I also kind of always try to make the, the connection between saying, say queer or queer space in this case, or queerness or, or sexual orientation, gender identity, whatever you want to call it, is an entry point. But it, you can never just stick to that entry point. It's always about kind of extending that, that discussion. Mm -hmm. uh, we have some questions uh, in the chat session. Uh, I want to start with the encouraging comment, actually, from yep. Jess Wallace. Uh, thank you for this conversation. If we had been having these conversations when I was attending Georgia Tech's undergrad architecture program 15 years ago. My life would look so different. It is fueling, validating to see others exploring, asking questions that I was too scared to. And that's very encouraging for us to have these events and like have you and discuss these issues. Uh, Another question is from Professor Jude LeBlanc. Uh, he thanks you and he quite enjoyed the work and uh, that he was not very familiar with. And the work reminded him of the street art of fluxes. So his question is, uh, why pit design excellence so consistently against a social political agenda? A talented designer like Joel Sanders negotiates board, board related. Is there not a difference between art versus architecture in relation to a critical analysis versus a positive proposal? Yeah, that's a that's a very good question. That's all, again one that I've been uh, thinking about for for a few years, uh, actually since I started working about since I was looking at uh, often proposals that were not building and that were not uh, uh, built projects it was kind of uh, people were often asking myself okay uh, kind of uh, why are you doing this within um, architecture studies or why why is it not are you not just going into art history or something like that and for me there there's two things there's one which is the the difference that I see between um, installations that are that are or works that are done by artists versus architects and and designers and um from the and uh, again i, I don't want to generalize and there's that's certainly not the the way that that i want to frame it but often the 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 work that i've seen art artists are much more interested in uh, or the work that artists do is showing us something is presenting it but, and it, it's asking questions, but it's not necessarily asking questions about how it can be reframed um, from from kind of a, 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 a material point of view, in a sense, where our designers and architects will often kind of ask or kind of bringing that question directly in the work and will try to engage people in kind of making that transformation. And it. it uh, I think kind of the example, the, the Mickett example is a, a fairly good one. Yes, it could be seen as a, as a performative work that would be done by, by uh, art or in performance art, but, um, but in this case, they are specifically doing it to think about what is the, the additions that are being uh, done to, to the environment uh, or not. But it's still, it, it's, it's still kind of fairly, um, fluid and ambiguous. So another uh, group that I worked on are two um, Scandinavian artists called M. Green and Draxed. And they are, they see themselves as artists. They really, but they've worked 
at the level of architecture. Like, I mean, they've built buildings as art practices. And so for me, it was really interesting to see how this was the, the opposite. And, and they've designed their own house. Um, uh, it, it's a very interesting work in terms of thinking about that relation of public and private and the way that, that gender play a role and that with the family play a role in uh, assumptions about this. And when I asked them, okay, you were involved in the design, and when I'm talking to the architect who worked with you, he said that this is actually your work, that he sees your work as that your your design, your co-designing as as a part of uh, as architecture. And they were telling me, no, we don't see ourselves as like we don't see this as architecture because we're really looking at it from from outside, and we're kind of bringing something. So that's where I think there's a there's a difference in in what what people are. Are doing and kind of how they, they come at it from from art or architecture, and then kind of looking at the example of Joel Sanders. Um, so I I I talked to Joel. So while I was doing my PhD, I was doing the work that that he did with with um, with the the Stahl project, and um, he was kind of coming back to gender and sexual uh, sexual orientation as a topic in architecture after a few years of not working on it. So he had done some 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 thinking about it in the 1990s, but he was kind of coming back to it. And one of one of his questions came from being invited to design um, a retirement community for LGBTQ people. And so um, that was really challenging for him to kind of say, okay. These ideas that I was looking at from a very theoretical point of view 15 years ago, now I have to apply. And it's not that easy to apply them. And it, it often ends up being, oh, we're doing kind of this, this really cool architecture, this really cool design for rich white men, in, in most cases, white gay, gay men. And we're kind of ignoring many people who are actually armed by the built environment. So how can we use these ideas that we're exploring in, in more um, in more critical projects and kind of bringing them into into this practice and kind of fueling the two ideas? And this is where I see kind of architects and designers as as having this I often having this behind the the the, pra, the the more critical practices that they do. So they see this as uh, something that will help us then better design, whereas for artists, it is it is about creating a better world. I think most artists are are trying to, to create something, but there's there's this limit between um uh, or or there's not this this second idea be, behind it in many cases. And again, it's not I don't want to generalize because there there's kind of different approaches in cases, but but it, it, that's kind of a, uh, something that I've been thinking and that I've been also kind of uh, discussing with students when, when I ask them to do uh, projects that are on the border between the, the limit between the two and what it what it means also to be bet between these two fields between art and architecture what it means about what you're allowed to bring into the discussion so going back to the hacking or the messiness of it, of it if you're doing something that you're not necessarily supposed to be doing or that it's not necessarily art architecture or we're not sure or where where it goes it it forces you to think about these questions and to to think about what they will do. Okay. And we have one last question from uh, one of our PhD students and friends, uh, Marisabel. Actually, she's in the presenting mode. Maybe she would like to ask it. Uh, Marisabel. Good. Hey. Can you hear me? Hi. Good to see you. <laughs> I was I was doing, going to put this in the typical place, but apparently I was in a moderator uh, link or some kind. So thank <laughs> you very much for joining us, and uh, I, I I just uh, really enjoyed your discussion and your presentation. And I had a few questions, and of course my question was really long. So then Heidi decided he didn't want to read it out, so he made me come on board. Um, <laughs> Let, let me see if I can sort of parse it. Uh, one of the one of the questions that I had had to do with um, uh, so so thank you for presenting this considering this notion that the individual identities play a role in defining um, our space and and enacting ideas about architecture. So um, and and you have shown us great examples uh, that I have not uh, seen uh, before 
of different means of how you can define a design education and also um, um, uh, exhibitions that, that, that establish a dialogue or seek to establish a kind of um, unfolding of, of, of these identities. Um, one of the things that though strikes me is this notion of framing, and you bring up, brought this up in uh, the, yeah. the, the first, um, uh, you know, just uh, uh, in that previous response, and this idea of framing, which uh, your examples all sort of occur basically within the unfolding of, uh, say, within the kind of a structured studio uh, pedagogy, or within uh, the framework of uh, what would be considered culturally safe zones, right? So even though we are looking at um, an interplay of activism, uh, architectural installation, critical approaches, and art, um, it's all occurring within a frame that, and my question is, does this frame inadvertently, uh, I guess, neutralize um, the questions or neutralize the sort of tensions that, that are, are kind of the instigators to begin with, right? And so that the minute that we have them in these culturally, you know, we present the, the, these in a culturally safe zone, does this neutralize attention? And is it that tension that we really do need to uh, keep alive, right? In order for uh, a proper dialogue and a proper uh, moving forward to take place. And so uh, in considering this in terms of pedagogy, in terms of instruction, uh, within the academy, I guess my, my short question to this long preamble is really, um, so it seems that the tension between uh, inside and outside, public and domestic, private, is a critical mechanism for engaging in a dialogue to begin with. And so how may pedagogy be structured uh, such that this tension remains live, but not destructive, right? So that it doesn't become a kind of a sort of situation where it's, Again, where polemics uh, undermines true communication, and then how can that active tension serve to energize that space that we have that you also present, which is the space between academia and local communities, and also inform a kind of a culture of broadening, uh, broadening discourse and broadening sure. conversation. Just simply put, long, yeah. long. Question. I'm sorry about that. No, that's great, but but it's it's kind of the, at the core of what, what, and that's where, again, kind of thinking about these, these different steps or these different strategies, it, I mean, what we, what we, or what I aim for at least, is kind of going towards what, what you're saying and kind of thinking about the, this, uh, um, this, this other space in a way that, that is challenging the, the way that, that everything is just being done over and over and over again. And that's where, that's where the example of Miket is particularly interesting because they are kind of trying to move themselves outside of the institution, even in, in kind of the work that they do. But also it, it points to some of the frustration, as I was saying, that, that for example, Katarina Bonavir was is, is having in, trying to, in terms of saying, okay, I'm trying to do this within within an academic, academic context and I'm kind of stuck and it just blocks. So I'm going to do this, this with, People who actually need me and who want to have this space, and you and I'm gonna amplify their voices. So she kind of steps back with make it from academia to be able to do this. So and yeah, I'm kind of saying, okay, no, we can't do this, but but, but we can successfully do it. But I actually do think that there is a way to do it. There is a way to, um, to as you say, kind of energize the, the space, um, and it really that's where it really depends on also who's um, who's present, who you, you're working with, uh, what kind of, of support you get. But for example, uh, I'm, I'm thinking, so last year, one of the studio I was doing was uh, working with um, a community group by and for queer, uh, queer uh, immigrants in, or queer migrants in Phoenix. And they came to me, they came to me, um, they wanted some help for us. Uh, but for me, it was really kind of crit critical that um, we created that kind of that kind of live discussion. Unfortunately, the the pandemic happened, so some of the things that were supposed to be so. so but uh, in terms of kind of making sure that this live thing uh, was working, was kind of broken a bit by the move to to a, a 
screen and, and even kind of the difficulty of accessing the, these technologies for, uh, for uh, people who are just arriving to the US. So, th so there was kind of a, a question of language also that, that was coming in, into play. And for the students to kind of even kind of think about all of these different layers of, of ethnicity, of, of race, of heritage, uh, kind of uh, uh, understanding of, of where we are, of, uh, of um, uh, queer identity kind of all coming into play was was really productive. And that's why I'm, I'm kind of also using using this example as kind of one of the positive way that that I'm thinking about breaking down the, this frame of the, obviously it was within an institutional frame. It was presented as such to the group that we were working with, but they were also very aware of this. They started, so this was great. So we started the first meeting when our students met them. And the, one of the, the kind of the, our, our, uh, the person, the, one of the person we were talking to in the, the, the group started with this very, um, anti-colonial, um, uh, anti-racial, uh, queer, uh, discourse about the land that we were on that that students told me they were really shocked by it like they were not expected to hear this in a studio in an architecture school in the, the environment but they said that this was so wonderful because suddenly they had to ask themselves okay where kind of where am i what what is this what can I, what have i what and they keep repeating kind of a year later they keep repeating i'll refreshing it was and and then how frustrating it was to go back to the traditional studio after that and just be told oh this is your user and this is your your client and just do this so so i think it, i i think we need to and i i'm not saying that this studio was was perfect and that it did kind of the, everything that needed to be done to really go into this but i think we need to do these little steps to um to also show that there's this potential and that we don't need to be afraid and that there, there won't be people, there might be some people kind of saying, oh, this, this shouldn't be it. Uh, this shouldn't be the way that we do it and all, all of that. And students, both students and other professors and, and maybe higher up, but, but that there, and we need to also um, uh, little by little break down the, the, or try to break down and it will be at some point we'll be stuck and we'll be facing uh, these, these, these kind of, no, this is within an institution, but but there's there, and that's where kind of going towards these these uh, grassroots efforts and and seeing what they can bring and try and try to also build these these relations over time. And um, again, so the, the idea with this project was that it would build over studios and studios, and that I also as what kind of when I have the strategy about acting beyond studio. Uh, beyond school is I, as 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 a person, I also am uh, um, uh, involved in a lot of design or, or um, community research on the side, outside of my academic life, and I'm in in so, some of these groups and and doing doing all, all of this. So I also talk about this experience with the students. I kind of as myself as as an as a professor as a, as a researcher. I'm based in these efforts, and so I kind of bring this. And I have a few colleagues at, at ASU who are doing it from architecture, but also from visual communications. For example, kind of how do you break down these these institutions of of, of graphic design, and what does it mean to do a mural festival, in, in a city where you have money that is being donated to do that. Who do you respond to? Who does that allow you in terms of, of involving many different people, showing or even kind of reflecting on, on how people react to it? So there, so there's a lot of questions and when that uh, when you kind of get out of the, the, the very clean, pure institution of, of the, the the university that we need to bring bring bring, but. But it's not like sometimes it doesn't work, and sometimes you end up having a studio that you wanted to have this really active discussion, and you end up saying, "Oh no, that, that didn't work." And and it was also really hard for for the students to kind of say. That was one of the feedback that I was getting from the students. Oh, I'm hearing something from the the people we're working with, and it's very excited, and it's allowing me to do something that I've never felt myself that I could 
that or allowing myself that I could do it. But then my the other people in the studio are thinking, oh no, you shouldn't do this. The reviewers at the crit will be telling you that that you shouldn't be doing this. And so they they are also facing this. And that's where I see my work as a kind of also being about encouraging students to say, no, like don't care about what you think the reviewers will be saying. You're you're you like listen to what what you're you're experimenting and it might not look nice and it might look but but you you kind of have to to do it so but that's that's the thing that happens when you look at some of these queer projects that are that I'm looking at they're presenting at the Museum of Modern Art they're presenting in they're presented in in log in in kind of all of these journals that are there there there's I don't want to talk about it that much but like there's there's a uh, one of my my um, someone I know who's doing uh, working on kind of trans people experience of space wanted to have uh, an opinion piece in the journal of architectural education so you had been told by the guest editors of an issue that he could be he could be more forward than than he sh that that like he could use a tone that was somewhat provocative and then he got told by the executive board of the, the, the journal that no, that's not the place. Like we we don't use this language in here. So like yeah. that's that's very like you want to have that the discussion and you want to have it in those institutions because that's where you show that this is a, something that you can have. But then do you do you mute yourself? Do you silence yourself? Do you use a Polish language? And I've been mostly doing this because I'm also someone that it's very that's very nice and and so I have all of these these things but I, but I, I I'm, I'm not someone who who, who will necessarily um, um, what's the word I want to use but scream at someone or something to make my point with I have other friends who do it and that's great we kind of balance ourselves I do it in a different way but but there should be a place for people to be um, to to be screaming like I mean there there the, some people are really 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 suffering from the built environment impact on them so they should be allowed to say I'm suffering and I and like to to uh, uh, what's the word I'm I'm looking for a word and I just can't find it it's bothering me but but <laughs> that they that like if you want to four a.m. yeah <laughs> so so yeah so I'll, I'll kind of end with this. There should be a space for people and for students also to be uh, outraged, to be saying this doesn't work at all, and we need to give them that that opportunity. And we need, uh, as I mean, in my case, as as an educator, to create that space where people feel comfortable to to say that they don't agree, to say that they're not represented, to say that their life or their lives are not represented, without being afraid of having. A, 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 a kind of a penalty on their grade or, or something and it, it's it's much more difficult than it sounds like I make it sound very easy but it's much more difficult than, than it sounds but that's what that's what I'm trying to do so yeah uh, if I may ask one more question Heidi and Yusuf permission granted so one one other question that I had had what what you what you kind of suggest which I think is really interesting is this idea of uh, eroding uh, a kind of an erosion that um, can be affected. And one of the, the most, um, I would say, um, time, uh, so we, we, we've got a very time-based structure to our education, especially when it comes to design education, uh, studio pedagogy that is sort of, you know, you have one semester where there's a problem, it's defined, you solve it by the end of the semester, and then you get your grade and onward. And um, I, I'm, I'm interested by what you're saying about this idea of how time itself, which, of, of course, is the, uh, inexorable uh, sort of, um, you know, uh, 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 judge of, all, of us all, uh, how, how you can make, uh, allow time to actually create the kind of environment of, of um, sort of a softening of the boundaries, and in this particular mm -hmm. case, the boundaries of, uh, uh, you know, that semester constraint and the, all, the, all the hoops that students are sometimes uh, feel that they have to sort of are kind of structured inside of. Um, with the idea of having kind of long-term projects or projects where it's not so much about one person's solution but about a different people's engagement into different facets of the project and that the project doesn't get resolved by the end of the semester because as we both know, as we, everybody knows, 
you know, you, you, you in, in the profession, you can work on a project for five years and you're still yeah. looking at drawings. Um, so, so this idea of just actually engaging in an architectural project or an investigation that doesn't that, that doesn't resolve itself at the end of the semester that you have engaged in as a participant but aren't quite you know the author of which involves all that ego and and, uh, and so forth whether that's a way of undermining some of these structures that you're talking about preventing um, sort of that broadening of the discourse. No, that's a that's a very very good point. I mean. Also, kind of thinking about the the time based uh, aspect of studio edu or practice based education, like like architecture, and going back to you said question about the socioeconomics, the, the yeah. thinking about architecture as cool as this kind of really frame thing that okay, you have to go through this studio, this studio, this studio it means that people who are who, who can't or don't have the money or the the, the to to work for or to, to go to school full time, it makes this very hard. So kind of thinking about this, there's also this, but kind of on the more time-based aspect of, of kind of learning around a project and thinking about a project, I, I, I think is a really good answer, or not answer, but question. And I think there, I don't necessarily have a, an answer for this. I mean, the experiments that I've done is, in, um, kind of bringing together to students, kind of grad students and undergrad students together at very different levels. So for example, I was looking at uh, bringing together on the same topic, but in, in different studios and then with, with points of, 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 of discussion together. So third year undergrad and incoming um, uh, grad students, but that had no background in design. So to, that they, so that they were kind of bringing very different life experiences to the the undergrad students who were then them for the most part having just gone through design school kind of uh, straight from from high school so to also kind of bring these these different life experiences into what what is is present in the project and kind of looking at the same project but just by having this raises some question it it was still stuck in one studio but at least it was kind of bringing um a time-based aspect in the sense of different lives coming into uh, different designers lives coming into the design of, pro of the project so that's that's one one thing that i've been doing um but that's a that's that's a very 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 good question in terms of kind of how do we do we go around this and it, it goes again with the idea of failure. Like I mean, I, I and and especially failure and the allowing for failure when you all, all only have three months of studio, kind of right. fifteen weeks of studio. What does that mean? And and it's a kind of I in, right now. So right now I'm not teaching studio. I'm just teaching. Um, uh, architecture or design history and theory and even in that there's so much pressure for students to kind of have this finished project and I I I ask them to do a project so I ask them to do a Wikipedia entry and that struggle with kind of thinking that what will be published at the end might disappear because it's not good enough or something like that and and reassuring them that they know, like what I'm interested in the process is in the question that you're asking yourself is in thinking about who you're representing or you're showing, who, what kind of discourse discourses are you are you bringing? It's, it's so 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 difficult for for people to think, okay, I'm gonna be judged on not on what I'm I'm submitting. What is, what is that? So so I think it kind of also plays with that notion of of, of the the. the time aspect of it because to really think about the the, the process you need to have these different this dif dif these different experiences and to learn from them and then to try again and to but if you're stuck in this very uh, narrow space you can do it and that's where kind of also encourage students to to try to go in outside of school to look outside of school to Come, so the, the community group I was working with last year, they had these parties every one month. So I, and they invited the students and they said to the students, like, kind of come see, see how we, 
how we already design ourselves the space and how we work around this. And wh even when you're done with the studio, come continue to come and, and think about what we're doing because we think that that we have something to also teach you. And, and many of the students did so and kind of were interested in kind of thinking of it as a longer. So, so it's, I mean, it, at this point, it, it, it's kind of, um, uh, it's, it's offering these opportunities, encouraging students to think of on the long term, but also acknowledging that, okay, we're stuck within this, this institutional framework, but talk about the students about this institutional framework and, and kind of how they can, they can go around it, uh, around it. Okay. I'm going to stop talking because I'm sure all of you have other things to do than listening to, to me. But, but, uh, again, thank you for the invitation. It was uh, it was really great to have this opportunity to share. I know that. So you you mentioned Ari, the the work that I've been uh, working on with the Society of Architecture Historians, and I know that Charles, that you had a few weeks ago, is also with me on that committee. So we're we're actively trying to. So I'm not just just speaking about it. We're actively trying to to make these changes everywhere. And I think that's that the main idea is that. It can be just one one little thing. It it it's an effort that needs to be done at all the different levels at the same time. Some of them might not do anything. Some of them might have consequences. So consequences. So it, it's kind of looking at all of these things together. Thank you. Thank you so much for spending the evening with us. Thank you. Bye.